Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to another lecture in American government. Uh, today, we begin a new module uh, and a new section. It's about political culture. Uh, let's begin with our lecture. Uh, first, political culture. Uh, let us define what we mean by that. What is political culture? Uh, political culture uh, refers to the values and the beliefs <clears throat> and the assumptions that people have about appropriate political behavior in a society. Uh, basically, these are deeply ingrained values that we have about how society ought to operate, okay? Uh, these values uh, are deeply embedded in us, and they have an impact on policy-making outcomes, okay? Uh, these values need not be factual or accurate, right? But they are dominant. So they don't have to be accurate values. They don't have to reflect reality. They are just dominant. Take, for example, uh, the belief in God. Americans in high numbers, 90% or more, say they believe in God. And yet, we have no way of proving, using the scientific method, the existence or lack thereof of a deity. We don't know if there is a God or not. And yet, we believe in it. So, values are not necessarily accurate, are not necessarily factual, but we believe in them nevertheless. All right? I'll give you another example. What is it? Probably 60% of Republican voters uh, believed that the election was stolen from Donald Trump, right? In their mind, in their mind, that's the dominant value of that election, in their mind. It was a stolen election. Reality, totally different. There is no evidence to suggest that there was massive fraud that overturned the result of the election from Donald Trump in favor of Joe Biden. All right? You might have any values that you like, but whether they are reflected in reality or not is a different thing altogether. All right. Uh, finally, write it down, despite their ethnic and religious diversity, Americans tend to have a cohesive political culture that unites them. Cohesive political culture that unites them. Uh, this is the cornerstone, in other words, of building American society. So, what are the elements, point A, of the U.S. political culture? What is it made up of? All right. First, individualism. Okay? The cornerstone of American political culture is a strong belief in individualism. Write it down. Individualism is the belief that your success or failure in life is in large part due to your own efforts. Success or failure in life is due to your own efforts. Let me 
show you the data on this. All right, so this data is taken from uh, the Global Attitude Survey, which is from uh, the Pew Research Center. Uh, Americans stand out on individualism. Percent who disagree, disagree that success in life is pretty much determined by forces outside our control. Okay? So do you disagree with this statement? Okay? Only 31% of Germans disagree. Only 32% of Italians disagree. 34% of Poles, 37% of Greeks, 47% of Spaniard, 50% of French people, 55% of British people, and Americans are the highest in their disagreement, 57%. So Americans seem to believe that they control their own life and they control their own destiny. And then here's another one. Percent who say it is very important on a scale from 0 to 10 to work hard to get ahead in life. 73% of Americans say it's important to work hard. Not so much for the Greeks, 21%, the French, 25%. Okay, so Americans seem to believe that uh, individual effort is what gets you ahead in life. All right, a very optimistic worldview, if you ask me. Uh, furthermore, on top of that first statement, individualism uh, places the rights and liberties of the individual ahead of the rights and liberties of the community. So people who are individualistic only pretty much care about themselves and one of the biggest reasons why we have a problem with people wearing masks in this country uh, to protect from the spread of uh, uh, COVID-19 is because they are individualistic. Uh, they believe that the government should not tell them what to do, even if it means that they can spread the disease. Uh, this is individualism right there, all right? But the best way to illustrate uh, American individualism uh, versus other countries uh, is to compare how to get a gun in the United States versus how to get the gun in, say, Japan or Canada. All right? So, uh, let's talk about how to get a gun in the United States. Uh, and let's pick Texas, for example. You want to get a gun there? Well, you go to the store. Uh, you... Uh, look at the gun that you want to purchase. You say, I want to buy this gun. Uh, if there is a background check in Texas, they will do a background check. If there isn't, they won't. Uh, then you just uh, take the gun and go on your way. All right? That easy, that simple. Uh, they don't ask for a mental evaluation of you. Uh, they don't ask whether you are in an unstable household or not. They don't ask why you need the gun. What is it for? You just purchase the gun and take it home and be on your merry way. Now, let's compare with Japan, and then we'll talk about Canada. In Japan, applicants first must go to their local police station and declare their intent. 
You don't do that in the United States. Then you are given a lecture, and then you must take a rain, uh, sorry, a uh, written test. So you're lectured and given a written test. Then you are taken to the range for training. You have to train how to shoot the gun. Then you are given a background check. Uh, the police, the police will more than likely talk to your neighbors to see if you have a temper if you have financial troubles or if you come from an unstable household and finally uh, a doctor must sign a form saying that the applicant has not been institutionalized is not epileptic depressed schizophrenic, alcoholic, or addicted to drugs, right? Now, let's talk about Canada, our neighbor to the north. An applicant for a firearm license in Canada must pass a background check which considers criminal, mental, addiction, and domestic violence records. So a comprehensive background check. Number two, in Canada, third-party character references for each gun license are required. So you need somebody to vouch that you are of good, outstanding character. Number three, in Canada, the authorities are required to conduct interviews with or to advise an applicant's spouse, partner, or next of kin before issuing a gun license. So they talk to your household, to your partner, to your spouse, to your family members. Four, where a past history or apprehended likelihood of family violence exists, the law in Canada stipulates that a gun license should be denied or revoked. Hmm? If there's a history of family violence, no gun for you. Five, in Canada, an understanding of firearm safety and the law tested in a theoretical and practical training course is required for a firearm license. So they conduct a test on you to make sure that you are knowledgeable of gun laws and how to use a firearm in the range. In Canada, gun owners must reapply and requalify for their firearm license every five years. So it's ongoing. And finally, in Canada, authorities maintain a record of individual civilians licensed to acquire, possess, sell, or transfer a firearm or ammunition. You see the difference? In Texas, it's the wild, wild west. In Canada, they take guns as seriously as we take driving cars. All right. You just don't go into a store in Canada 
and purchase a firearm. Just like that. Now, what are the policy implications of this? This belief in rugged individualism, especially when it comes to gun ownership, has policy implications. This is uh, data taken from uh, United Nations Office of Drugs and Crime, 2016. It's a homicide rate by firearm per 100,000 people. This is a rate. So basically, how many people per 100,000 die by firearms? Now, as you can see, in Japan, it's 0.28%. Okay, very low. Uh, in Belgium, it's low. In Canada, it's low. In Finland, it's low. All these countries that you see in blue, the blue bars, they are considerably low. Look at the United States, very high. 5.35 people die from firearm per 100,000 people. Okay? That's a lot. We are much higher than other countries. Now, why? Well, uh, put it simply, in other countries, they have something called gun control. They put the safety of the community ahead of your right to own a gun. It's far more important to make sure that the community is safe from guns than you owning the gun. In the United States, it's the reverse. Your ownership of a gun is far more important than the safety of the community from that gun. And that's why we have these numbers. Individualism has serious implications. This is one of them. The spread of COVID-19 is another one. People don't want a mask. They believe of themselves as individuals. The government dare not tell us what to do. By contrast, in Taiwan, they don't have the problems that we have. Why? Because there the people listen to the government. Again, it's a democracy, Taiwan. But people listen, they pay attention, they say, oh, it's good for the community to wear a mask to prevent the spread of the disease. Same in New Zealand, same in Australia. Not so much in the United States. All right. Next item on the agenda is equality. Okay? equality. There are two types of equality in the United States. Two types of equality in the United States. The first type of equality is equality of opportunity. All right? Equality of opportunity. This is the belief that there should not be any legal barriers to prevent a person's achievement. So there shouldn't be laws that discriminate and deny people their right to achieve. Okay? With few exceptions, few exceptions, and I will tell you what one of them is in a minute. The United States, the United States has achieved equality of opportunity in front of the law. Now, that does not mean that there isn't racism. Of course, there is. That doesn't mean that there isn't sexism. Of course, there is. But in front of the law, there isn't, with one exception. In some states, okay, about 25 or 28 of them, in some states, you can still lose your job 
for being gay. Yes, 2021, in some states, you can still lose your job for being gay. That denies equality of opportunity. Not in California. That doesn't apply in California. In California, legally, you cannot be fired for being gay. But in other states, red states. All right. The second type of equality that I'm going to talk about is equality of results. All right? Equality of results. Equality of results is the belief that the government should actively reduce income and wealth inequality in a society. The government should actively be involved and reduce income and wealth inequality in a society. So the question becomes, which type of equality do Americans believe in? Do they believe in equality of results? Or do they believe in equality of opportunity? This is a question from the Pew Research Center. It says, individual liberty versus state counties. What's more important in our society that everyone be free to pursue their life's goal without interference from the state or that the state play an active role in society so as to guarantee that nobody is in need? Look at the difference. You can see the stark difference. Majorities in the UK, in Poland, in Germany, in France, in Spain, in Lithuania say that the government should be involved to promote equality of results so that nobody is in need. By contrast, Americans believe in equal opportunity, freedom to pursue goals without state interference. So there you have it. Americans believe, write it down, in the concept of equality of opportunity and not the concept of equality of results. Okay? Here again, what uh, people believe in has policy implications on equality or inequality in a society. What you see before you is the Gini coefficient index from 1990 to 2017, right? The Gini coefficient index measures income and wealth inequality in a society. It's a number, and the number varies from zero to one. Uh, when it is at zero, it's perfect equality. When it is at one, it's perfect inequality. No country in the world is at zero, and no country in the world is at one. They all vary, all right? So as you can see, uh, the country closest to zero out of the bunch that, is, that are listed is Finland, 0 0.255, okay? Closest in terms of income and wealth equality. In fact, if you look at the top four, okay, Finland, Norway, Sweden, and Iceland, these are what we call social democratic countries, okay? Social democracy, aka democratic socialism. Basically, they mix democracy with socialism in order to promote the well-being of the largest amount of people in society. United States is at the highest, 0 0.371 average between 1990 and 2017. Uh, today, it's about 0 
eight or four five or something like that. But this is an average. So it's even higher than that. The United States has the highest level of income and wealth inequality among similarly advanced countries. In large part, this is driven by this belief in equality of opportunity, not equality of results. Everybody in America believes that they are going to become a millionaire. Everybody in America believes that they are going to be the next Jeff Bezos, the next Elon Musk, the next Bill Gates. That, of course, is not true. Is not true. Most Americans begin and finish their life in the same class that they started in. All right? Let me show you some numbers. This is a chart uh, that shows you the relationship. On one axis, you have the Gini coefficient index, right? And on the vertical axis, you have intergenerational earning mobility. Basically, are you going to earn more in income than the previous generation. The higher the number, right, the more intergenerational mobility. The lower the number, the less intergenerational mobility. Gini coefficient, the lower the number, the more equality. The higher the number, the more inequality. Now, let's see where these countries place. All right. Let's look at Denmark. Denmark has a low Gini coefficient index and has a high intergenerational mobility. So does Finland. So does Norway. So does Canada. Right? All of them have higher intergenerational mobility than the United States of America. The United States of America, Italy, Great Britain, and France all these countries, right? They have a high Gini coefficient index and low intergenerational mobility. So what does that tell you? It tells you that income and wealth inequality correlates with lower intergenerational mobility. It tells you bluntly that those people who believe they are going to become the next Elon Musk or the Jeff Bezos or the Bill Gates are deluding themselves. They are not. Because intergenerational mobility is very low in the United States. Is this clear? Do you understand the relationship? All right. Okay, so on our uh, lecture outline is another uh, value. It's the value of limited government. Americans say that government should be limited in its size and limited responsibilities and power okay limited in its size and its responsibilities and power however since September 11th 2001 since that big terrorist attack that happened on American soil Americans have been more willing to allow encroachment and expansion of government control of their lives. I will give you some numbers. Uh, in 2002, right after September 11th, 
49% of Americans wanted the government to limit free expression. Wow. 49%. That's crazy. That's half. In 2004, 52% wanted to restrict freedom on the Internet. In 2003, 2003 55% of Americans supported holding suspects of certain crimes indefinitely without a trial. Indefinitely without a trial by those suspects in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. In 2006, 60% of Americans favored racial profiling of people from the Middle East. Okay? Now, all these actions require more government power and more government responsibility. So, it flies in the face of the value that Americans want a government that is limited in size and limited in responsibilities and power. Okay? Number four, fourth item in American political culture is free market capitalism. They refer to it as uh, free enterprise. They refer to it as free market. They refer to it as capitalism sometimes. Write it down. Americans say that they believe in free market capitalism. All right? Now, here again, this is changing, especially with millennials and the Z generation, your generation. Most of you are Generation Z. So this is changing. In 2018, young people, young people have shown a negative view of capitalism and a positive view of socialism. Only 45% have a positive view of capitalism, while 51% have a positive view of socialism. So yeah, this value of belief in capitalism is still there and make no mistake both parties that we have are capitalist parties the democrats are a capitalist party and the republicans are a capitalist party as well so we ask this question what are the elements of uh, free market capitalism what do we mean by that? All right. First, in a free market capitalist society, the means of production are owned by the individual or the corporation. So what is used in production, the factories, tools, the buildings, the machines, okay? All of these are either privately owned by one individual or are privately owned by a corporation. That's what we mean, private ownership of the means of production. The government should not own the means of production in a fully capitalist society, all right? Second, deciding where to produce, when to produce, how to produce, and what to produce. 
so production decisions are carried by individuals and corporations carried by individuals and corporation the government should not interfere and tell corporations where when what and how to produce case in point let me give you a historical example the city of Detroit was the center of the US auto industry at one point in the 60s Detroit was the wealthiest city in America wealthiest city it had over 50 factories producing cars GM by itself employed 600,000 people in the United States General Motors now they employ about 50,000 people in the US directly so Detroit was a very wealthy wealth city then beginning in the early 80s late 70s corporations car manufacturing corporations GM Ford Chrysler started moving their automotive production overseas why well cheaper labor primarily and the ability to pollute in less developed countries so they moved overseas did the u.s federal government and the u.s state governments tell them not to do that no they didn't they didn't interfere they allowed them to do that because they believe in the principle that corporations should decide without interference from the government so these corporations left Detroit Detroit grew poorer and poorer and now Detroit is the poorest or one of the poorest cities in America it had to file for bankruptcy do you understand the implications of believing in this aspect of the free market all right third aspect of the free market the price of the goods and services produced is determined by supply and demand provided the market is competitive the prices of goods and services produced is determined by supply and demand uh, provided the market is competitive okay so what do we mean by the market is competitive I'm holding a pen in my hand right pen in my hand if there is a shortage of pens then the price of the pen will go up and if there is a glut of pens then the price of pens will go down provided the market is competitive meaning that there are a lot of producers of pens and a lot of consumers of pens clear all right 
Finally, final item on free market capitalism is this. The profits from the sale of goods and services go to the individual or the corporation. Go to the individual or the corporation with the government taking in an increasingly smaller percentage in taxes. Give you a number. In 2018, U.S. corporation paid only 7% in taxes on their profits, down from 14% in 2017. So it was cut in half. Some corporations like Amazon, if I remember correctly, haven't paid taxes for two years straight. Okay? Fifth item on our political culture is democracy. Now, by democracy, we mean representative democracy. Write it down. America's political culture is a democratic one. Democratic one. Americans believe that a representative form of government is the best form of government. However, in 2017, in 2017, only 46 percent of Americans, 46 percent of Americans, were satisfied with the way democracy is working in the United States. 46 percent. Not even a majority were satisfied. Now, this is very dangerous, this lack of satisfaction in democracy. Why is it dangerous? Because all you need is some demagogue to become president and convince the U.S. public to walk away from a democratic form of government into an authoritarian one. Not to use that as an example, because history is different, but Hitler did just that. Hitler was elected, and then he convinced the German people, slowly but surely, to give up on the democratic form of government, because they were dissatisfied with that form of government. It is dangerous to have only 46% satisfaction in the way democracy is working in the USA. Next up, number six, uh, liberty and freedom. Liberty and freedom. Write it down. Americans are ambivalent. Ambivalent means uh, wishy-washy. You know, yes, we believe, no, we don't. Ambivalent in their support of freedom and liberty. They support, they support freedom in the abstract. So if you ask them, do you support freedom of expression? They say yes. They support freedom in the abstract, but they do not support freedoms in particular instances. 
okay? So let me share with you the data to support such a statement. Okay, so this is a uh, chart uh, that I created taken from uh, the General Social Survey website data. General Social Survey does a survey every two years. Whenever there's an election, they do a survey and they look at data uh, and they collect data and they share it with us. So it's very nice to look at. And it is ambivalence about freedom of expression. All right. So let's look about the ambivalence that Americans have. Should, should the media be censored for national security reasons, i.e. during war, right? More than 60% of Americans said yes. So Americans don't want to know what's happening during a war that America is involved in. It's really amazing. I mean, you really don't want to know what's going on. So, yeah, censor the media for national security reasons. Uh, another one. Should we ban dangerous books? 50% of Americans want to ban so-called dangerous books. Well, uh, again, do you agree on what a dangerous book is? Um some high schools and middle schools, uh, they want to buy, to ban books uh, because it has the N-word in it, okay? Uh, to Kill a Mockingbird, for example, they're thinking of banning, banning To Kill a Mockingbird, even though To Kill a Mockingbird was, was a book that is anti-racism as a book. Uh, should we ban radical Muslim books? Again, 50% want to ban books. Uh, porn is harmful. Again, more than 50% believe porn is harmful. 70% uh, believe internet porn is harmful. Uh, here... This last two shows you the contradiction in Americans' thought processes. So, is extremist speech okay? Wonderful. More than 50% say extremist speech is okay. The, the blue, the blue bar, right? So, extremist speech, which is the abstract, is okay. Then you ask them something specific. Is Muslim hate speech okay? Now, Muslim hate speech is a subset of extremist hate speech. But that, that all of a sudden is not okay. So here you have it. Abstract, yeah, okay. But then you put a specific group and then Americans are not okay with it. So uh, they support freedom in the abstract, but not necessarily in the concrete. Uh, this chart also mm, shows you something similar. Uh, it has several traces. Atheists speak, communists speak, racists speak, atheists teach. Uh, communist teach, racist teach, radical Muslim teach, etc., etc. Uh, and then it asks, should atheists, communists, racists, radical Muslims be allowed to speak or teach at college? Right? At college. Well, uh, you can see that Americans do not support racists teaching at college. Uh, you can see that Americans do not support radical Muslims teaching at college. Uh, again, they do not support uh, communists speaking in large numbers. They do not support racists speaking in large numbers. Uh, they do not support atheists speaking or teaching in large numbers. So, as you can tell, here again, it shows you the ambivalence of Americans' uh, attitude towards freedom of expression 
and freedom of speech. All right, so one final item uh, on America's political culture that we're going to talk about before we wrap up is piety. What does piety mean? Piety is uh, being religious. If you're pious, excuse me, you are a religious person. So write it down. Let's talk about piety in American society and its implications. 90% of Americans say they believe in God. Okay? Say they believe in God. Between 75 to 80% of Americans say that prayer is an important part of their daily lives. Uh, 82% say that religion plays an important part in their lives. And finally, almost 85% believe in the Day of Judgment. Okay, so these are high numbers showing us that indeed American society says it is a religious one. Now, uh, what is a hypothesis? A hypothesis is not an educated guess. So throw that out the window. So what is a hypothesis? Write it down. A hypothesis is an if-then statement, if-then statement, that is testable, measurable, and replicable. Testable, measurable, and replicable. All right. I'm holding in my hand this stand, okay? This metal iPad stand. Okay? I want a hypothesis on this. So what is the hypothesis? If I let go of this metal stand, then it will fall to the ground. Is this testable? Yes. Is it measurable? Yes. Can you replicate it at home? Yes. Let's do it. Oh my God, it fell. Not only did it fall, it bounced. That is a hypothesis. An if-then statement that is measurable, testable, and replicable. So now, I'm going to show you some data, and we are going to draw a hypothesis from that data. Okay, so here is a uh, screenshot of the relationship between uh, development, okay, development, and being religious. Now, we measure development by, right here you see at the bottom, GDP per capita, okay? 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, 40,000, 50,000, 60,000 dollars, right? This is on the horizontal axis. You can see the numbers. So the more a country is to the right, the more developed it is. Income correlates with development. The higher the income, the more developed a country is. Generally speaking, all else being equal. On the vertical axis, we have an answer to percent who say religion is very important in their lives. Okay? So, what is the hypothesis here? What can we draw from this chart as far as a hypothesis is concerned? We look at it and we say what exactly? Here's what we say. The higher the income in a country, i.e. 
the more developed a country is, see it? The more developed a country is, the less religious that country will be. So Australia, Germany, Canada, UK, France, Japan, South Korea, Spain, Italy, all these countries have high incomes, right? Which means they are developed. And also, they have low levels of religiosity. Now, the reverse is also correct. The lower the income of a country, if you look at the top left-hand corner of the chart, the lower the income of a country, the more religious it will be. So, the less developed a country is, the more religious it will be. Look at the countries in red. Ethiopia, Senegal, Uganda, Ghana, Nigeria, and the blue ones, Philippines, Pakistan, Indonesia, India, Jordan. All these countries have low levels of development and it correlates with high levels of religiosity. Okay? You got that? Now, what is missing from the equation is the United States. Let's look at the United States, shall we? Here is the United States added to the equation, right? As you can see, the United States is pretty high on GNP or GDP per capita. On that measure, it is one of the highest in the world. But when it comes to religion, the United States has a similar level of religiosity to Turkey and Lebanon. Okay? So the United States is the exception to the rule. The rule is the more developed a country is, the less religious it will become. The United States is more developed, but also religious. Do you understand this? Now, the question becomes, why is the United States like this? Off the top of my head, I can think immediately of two reasons why the United States is developed and religious at the same time. Here's why. Number one, the United States began its existence as a highly religious society. Okay? It is very religious. It had a Judeo-Christian uh, religious culture as far as society is concerned. So that's number one. Uh, number two, the United States is a society of immigrants society of immigrants and since the 1980s since the 1980s most immigrants coming into the United States come from less developed countries less developed countries and we just said that in less developed countries People tend to be religious. So when these immigrants from less developed countries come to the United States, what do they bring with them? Their religiosity. Okay? So that continuously replenishes the religious element within American society. And these are the two reasons off the top of my head that I can think of that make the United States a more religious society and also a developed society.
society. And on this note, we have come to the end of the lecture, and I will say bye-bye. <laughs>